eye movements can reveal a wealth of information about things like your neurological health, your desires and interests, and you know, fundamentally, your state of mind. And so the, uh, the expression you know, that, that, that the eye is the window into the soul, as cliched as it sounds, it actually is backed up by uh, a rich body of literature. Um, but really the point I want to drive home is that we think that eye tracking uh, in XR systems will, have, will be just as impactful as capacitive multi-touch interfaces have been for the mobile handset industry. The second you know, takeaway point that I think is quite important is that you know, over, the, uh, over the course of, uh, you know, <coughs> The, the increase in mobile data consumption, what we've kind of observed is that the exponential growth will require a whole new type of network infrastructure. But because of the exponential growth in data consumption, we are pretty confident that a lot of the data here will be visual data. And that's because for humans, the highest bandwidth input into the human is actually through the eyes. Um, now, we we think of the eye as, as not just a high bandwidth input into the brain, but also as an output mechanism. So there's a real risk in trying to pipe too much data into the eye. There's only so much data you can get from the small screen of a cell phone. And so this community is very specifically trying to get the, the screen to be bigger and bigger and bringing it closer and closer to your face. And the risk there is that you can easily overwhelm someone with way too much data. So we think of the eye as also an output mechanism that, that we can use to curate that data. So by studying the hundreds of thousands of eye movements that you make every day, we can understand whether a user is frustrated or interested in content or confused or engaged and is actually reading content. Um, so we really do believe that new input modalities will be required in order to curate the data for um, augmented reality and, and XR systems. So what have we learned so far using eye tracking systems? So the first thing that we've, we've uh, observed is that your eyes are always moving. So as you're scanning around a scene, you make these large saccades that uh, allow you to change your fixation from one place to another. But then as you zoom into an area of interest, you make smaller micro saccades. So these micro saccades are actually uh, allowing you to, to, to really take in more precise information. But even when you think you're fixated on something and you're just looking at a fixed point in space, there are tinier movements called intersaccadic drifts that are really required for you to continuously refresh your retinal cells. So another thing that we've, we've done with uh, eye movement data is that you know, while taking eye tracking data simultaneously with other biomedical imaging modalities, we've been able to uncover uh, an almost complete picture of the brainstem circuitry that underlies the you know, the movements that the eyes make. And so you, by monitoring the tiniest changes in eye movement dynamics, we're actually able to determine uh, whether you've had a concussion, whether you have early onset symptoms of certain neurodegenerative diseases, and a whole bunch of other things about the state of mind that you're in. And finally, a, a very popular application for eye tracking is in market research. So you can set someone loose in a grocery store and try to understand whether your product placement is, has been optimized or whether your website is, uh, is actually driving the point home. So, you know, the way that we've been doing eye tracking so far is, uh, is by using cameras to take hundreds of pictures of your eyes every second. And each of those images is actually post-processed so that you can look for the center of the pupil and a glint from an infrared source and figure out what the gaze vector of the eye is. So one thing I'd like to point out here is that you know, if you look at the architecture of uh, the, the most popular types of eye movement um, measurement systems today, they haven't really evolved that much from the point of the Yar Yarbus eye tracker, which was available in the 1960s. So this thing kind of looks like a medieval torture instrument, but really it just has two cameras that are pointing at your eyes. There's some illumination and it's taking video. And so, you know, obviously we can leverage economies of scale and the exponential improvement in, uh, that Moore's law has, has afforded us with CMOS image sensors and computing. And so now you can do all of this in a much smaller form factor. But one of the points that I wanted to drive home here today is that if you design a microsystem from scratch and you really design it to do one thing and do that one thing really well, you should be able to, um, to achieve order of magnitude improvements in, in the performance across multiple specifications. So what we really observed with, with the state-of-the-art technology was that because you're doing image processing of every frame 
and you're running this algorithm that has to extract eye position from the image, you really have to burn a lot of compute and you have to burn a lot of electrical power. You're limited in the frame rate that you can achieve and there's a pretty long latency between when your eyes move and when the data is available. So we decided to start from scratch and we built a microsystem that doesn't use any cameras. So what you'll see in this video is that we have a tiny chip and that chip scans a beam of light across the eye. And because the curvature of the cornea, the radius of curvature of the cornea is different from that of the eyeball and the centers are offset, when that beam sweeps across the eye, there's only one angle at which it'll reflect onto the photodiode. So we're receiving about 4,500 pulses per second at this photodiode to reveal where the eye is looking. A couple of other things to note here are that the little scanner that we use is microscopic. You kind of have to look through a microscope to get this video. But it is actually able to move very quickly in two degrees of freedom. So we're able to track the eye movement both in the X and Y direction. And the last thing I'll mention is that these are not micro mirrors per se. They have a diffractive optic element on them, which allows them to both collimate and redirect the beam from our Vixel. And what that does is it allows us to put everything together in a very compact package that'll fit unobtrusively into VR and AR headsets. So when all is said and done and we benchmark our system against some of the state-of-the-art systems, we find that, first of all, it's very easy to integrate our system into VR and AR headsets. We don't need cameras and MIPI lines and controlled impedance routing throughout the headset. We don't need these hot mirrors and other types of kind of unwieldy um, you know, integrations. It's very straightforward for us to just pop out the retaining ring that you see in most VR headsets and replace it with one that has our scanner module and photodiode in it. So integration is very important. The other thing that's important is that our speed, uh, you know, we're routinely able to track with over one kilohertz of bandwidth. Um, and of course, because of the fact that there's very little compute between when that edge is detected and when the data is available, our latency is sub two milliseconds now, and it's only gonna continue to get better. But really the important factors that I think are gonna be impactful for AR and VR are first of all, that our, our uh, power consumption can very easily scale down to about 50 milliwatts, which means you can run our eye tracker off of a battery for an entire day. And the other thing is that you don't really require much communication bandwidth because you're not streaming video. So what can we do with this system? So this is actually a few examples of some data that was grabbed with an uncalibrated system. You can see the vestibulo-ocular reflex, saccades, and the OKR signatures of eye movement that are very, very clear. But what's interesting is that our sampling rate is about a kilohertz. And when you compare that to the black X's, which are occurring at about 60 hertz, you see that you get much, much richer data, time series data. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that if you can take enough data points per second on position, then you can take the derivative and measure velocity with very low noise. And the velocity profiles of these saccades that your eyes are making when you're scanning across the room are very consistent. So as soon as we've identified that a saccade is occurring, we can actually predict where you're gonna look about 20 milliseconds before you look there. And that's very important for foveated rendering, but it's also useful for gesture detection. Um, so this is just some examples of raw, again, uncalibrated data of a person reading a paragraph of text. Each of these clusters is a fixation, which is when you're trying to interpret the word. And you see these small velocity spikes in the upward direction when you're reading across the line. And then when you get to the end of the line and jump backwards to the next word in the, the first word in the next line, you see these larger negative velocity spikes. Um, and this is the unfiltered kind of signal, duration, signal to noise ratio that we can get on velocity. And so these uh, points in the curves uh, in the top right over here reveal when we're actually able to make a robust prediction. Okay, um, so in this video, we're actually using, taking advantage of our high sampling rate to control the interface. So in this case, we're just uh, simulating the interface of some AR glasses using just an iPhone screen. And just by making these simple eye gestures, these glances, we're able to scroll down. Um, we're able to select an application like this, uh, read this book. But then what you'll notice is that when you're actually reading the text, so at this point the subject is reading the text, you don't get any false positives. So we have this thin gestural layer that resides above our tracking algorithm that allows you to actually very effortlessly interact with, with a mobile computer. So there's a, a large spectrum of use cases of eye tracking in, uh, in both AR and VR systems. Uh, so I'm just gonna cherry pick a few of them that we've implemented in our demos. So one of them is this uh, you know, simulated depth. So by measuring vergence, you can actually bring into focus uh, something that you're actually interested in while putting everything else out of focus. Another one is remote assistance. So in the enterprise, if you're training someone how to operate 
an oil rig, you definitely want to make sure that they looked at the pressure gauge before they opened the valve. So it's very useful to have eye tracking uh, combined with a front-facing camera for training scenarios. And then there's actually a number of very interesting display architectures that are coming out that will actually make use of eye tracking to figure out where your entrance pupil of your optical system is and match that to the exit pupil of the, of the display system so that you can increase the size of your eye box. So this is also something that's going to require very precise, very high speed eye tracking. So in VR, uh, we also think that there's a number of very interesting use cases. We have uh, demos where you can target objects just by looking at them and then you know, fire at them. Um, of course, we can also assess your fatigue while you're in uh, a VR game by looking at peak velocities of saccades and durations of blinks. Um, but really, I think what we're most excited about these days is capturing the intent and the state of the user. So what does that really mean? Well, when we started our company, we really thought of ourselves as just a semiconductor, a fabulous semiconductor company. We were just going to sell chips to OEMs that would integrate them into their headsets. But what we realized is that we, we, we couldn't just sell the chips. It really made a lot of sense for us to work our way up the value stack and provide a full solution to the customer. So now we have you know, firmware that does things like endpoint prediction and gestural uh, detection. But we also have applications in Unity and uh, in Python and, and in C that allow us to demonstrate things like foveated rendering and this, this simulated depth of field. But as we started collecting this data and sharing it with optometrists and neurologists, we realized that the sampling rate and the quality of data that we were taking was so high that we were actually able to extract real meaningful information about the state of a user. We can tell when you're looking at a display whether you're confused by the UI or whether you know exactly what you want to do with it. We can tell when an ad pops up if you've read it because we get a very strong signature of that kind of thing. But we can also tell if you're anxious when you're driving around in traffic. And that's the nice thing about being able to do real-time eye tracking in a mobile context. We're going to be getting data on human eye movements that's kind of unprecedented in terms of you know, throughout the course of the day after you've had a coffee. And so as we store this data, we really want to make it possible to do what humans already do. When I look into your eyes, I can tell if I know you well, um, you know, what kind of a state you're in or how you're reacting to what I'm telling you. And I think a machine learning algorithm can look at this time series data and extract that kind of meaning as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Another thing that we're really excited about is you know, looking at how the industry is shaping up. So we really believe that we're kind of uh, past the, the, the hype cycle in VR. And we're starting to see new classes of VR headsets evolve. Uh, and, and the ecosystem is really starting to be segmented into these high-end consoles, um, all the way down to very uh, delightful mobile VR experiences that are coming out. And we think eye tracking will actually play a role in all of these categories. So we're excited to talk to as many of, of the, the OEMs as we can um, to, to share our excitement about what they can do with eye tracking. But we also believe that there are people in the GPU pipeline, including NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, uh, and of course people who are making reference designs for AR and XR systems, that would also uh, benefit greatly from, from thinking about how eye tracking could enhance your experience. Uh, we feel like it's the same kind of deal with, with AR, but you know, the, the industry is a little bit more nascent. But where we really feel like our technology will shine is in these very lightweight uh, AR smart glasses where you really don't have the power or the room for a bulky eye tracking system, but you're likely to be wearing these things all day. So the eye movement data that you can capture and the way that you can adjust the computing experience and really curate it based on the person's eye movements um, will really be impactful in these areas. So before I conclude, um, uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to make sure that I drove home. So you know, we've developed the first camera-free eye tracking system that makes use of a custom microsystem to really do one thing and to do it, we think, uh, really well. Um, so far, our specifications have, have achieved order of magnitude improvements across some of the key uh, areas of importance, like bandwidth, latency, power consumption, and form factor. And we also think that it's very easy to integrate our solution into headsets. Um, we think that with eye tracking, we're really going to be able to enable more immersive and, and, and untethered VR and AR experiences uh, through things like you know, eye gesture recognition, uh, endpoint prediction, and foveated rendering. And uh, you know, I think the research community has been uh, you know, very receptive to this technology because they can finally start to do things like um, do much more routine and, and uh, frequent eye movement examinations than what you uh, currently are kind of um, exposed to today. 
so the one thing that, that I think is uh, also important about this microsystem approach is that we're doing it at the 8-inch CMOS wafer scale, which means we can leverage economies of scale to really get you know, millions of these things produced uh, just by turning a crank at some very well-established foundry partners that we have. And that's super important because there's 7 billion pairs of eyes in the world that are all you know, the most important sensory input to humans. And we really do believe in the future of XR, and, and we want to be able to support um, those types of volumes. So before I conclude, I should mention that I'm very lucky to work with uh, you know, a team of engineers and scientists of the highest caliber. Uh, we have about 20 people now at Ad Hoc Microsystems, and we come into work every day very passionate about being able to have you know, a transformative impact in this field. Uh, and the research itself has been funded by DARPA, CMC, OCE, and the ORF for over a decade, actually. Um, and that's how long it took us really to, to develop the platform technology that allows us to position things on a chip with sub-nanometer resolution and pick up really, really tiny signals. So we're, pretty, uh, we're, we're quite grateful about the, the support that we've had from the research community. Um, and so, so that's it. So I'm happy to take some questions. Yes. So, uh, one of the pieces of information that your technology misses is the dynamics of the size of the fuel that has to contain a lot of information around the and stuff like that. If your machine learning algorithm that is tracking dynamics of the movements of the eyes may not put that information into your knowledge, or what? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Can we actually capture um, the iris, the size of the pupil? And, and the short answer to the question is yes, we can actually make use of our same system to, um, to act as a very high speed kind of the, do something like a single pixel camera. So we, we are able to capture those signals, but what we found is that the signal to noise ratio on pupil size is actually pretty bad. So, you know, the amount of change in the pupil diameter just from turning the lights on or off is like 10 times higher than the types of changes that you might see from an emotional response. So we think of the dynamics of eye movement as being a stronger indicator of some of these emotional states. But if you take relative measurements and you do some differential tricks, the, I'm sure that there's some, some information buried in pupil size. So it's an interesting question, but it's not really something we're addressing right now. Uh, uh, two things. One, one is about maybe a mistake about how accurate is the eye gaze, and the other thing is uh, how do you make it to how do you direct the uh, the sensor towards the eyes? Because in in the devices usually it could be here that it, that it's not the eye. The relative position of the eye is very different from person to person. Sure. Yeah. So the resolution, as measured by the RMS noise in the system is about 0 0.25 degrees. And the accuracy really depends on your calibration. So we're able to achieve about two or three degrees of accuracy across the field. Um, your second point, uh, which is that um, you know, our angle of incidence is not along the optic axis, um, th you know, that's just out of convenience. You really want to be able to integrate these things unobtrusively in glasses and not have any sort of interference. So we are coming in at a glancing angle but there's pretty, uh, a pretty simple coordinate transformation that we do to get back into the coordinate system of the eyeball. Okay, thank you. That's